So as Linda mentioned, um, uh, I'm in the Department of Ecology and Evolution. I call, you know, I consider myself an evolutionary biologist, and um, and I've been teaching a course in evolution there for well, um, uh, almost fifty years actually, um, and um, uh, and which is and and then I've also been a birder for well, you know, more than fifty years. I you know started at the age of about ten, and. Um, and you know, and and one of the things that has been you know very clear is that an enormous amount of what we know, let's put it this way, there are many, many topics that fall under the umbrella of evolutionary biology, because every species of organism on Earth has evolved from antecedent ancestors, and every feature of every species, whether you're talking about its anatomy, its biochemistry, its, its, um, its behavior, its, um, its you know, thermal tolerances, or whatever, every feature of every species is has an evolutionary history you know has come into into, into existence by you know by 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 evolution and um and so what that means is that uh, that a course in evolution covers many many different um, aspects of biology um, from an evolutionary perspective and i realized you know along the line that you know i could almost teach i could teach almost all the topics in this evolution course just using examples from birds um, and um, uh, because so much research has been done on birds, because of course they are they are in many ways so much easier to study than many organisms, uh, other organisms are. And of course, many many people come into biology because they've been inspired by 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 seeing birds when they were young. Well, you know, like myself and like many of you. Um, and so uh, and so this eventually led me to the idea of of writing a book. That was basically about evolution, but from the perspective of of bird examples. Okay, and you can flip that around and say, what does evolution have to teach us about birds? Okay, and as I said, since every characteristic of every organism has an evolutionary history, this means that I'd be concerned here not just with where did birds come from, you know, birds from dinosaurs. But I'd also be concerned about understanding how do different species of birds evolve from you know from common ancestors. You know what you know, what gives rise to new species. Um, what give, you know how do we account for the great diversity of different characteristics of species? How do we account for their color patterns? How do we account for their behavior? For their life histories? How do we account for the geographic distributions of birds, you know, and so forth? And so that is so 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 that and much more is actually the subject of this book and um, and the subject of this lecture. Although the lecture could easily be three times as long, and I fear it may be already too long as is. So let's just move into the first slide. And thank you very much, Brian, for agreeing to run the slides for me. So this is a photo that I took not too many years ago um, uh, at about 11,000 feet in the Andes in <laughs> Bolivia. Um, and um, <laughs> you can see it's rather a stark landscape. Uh, the, you know, the tallest plant is, you know, is about six or seven inches high and that mostly grasses. And uh, Darwin did not go to Bolivia, but he did go to Chile. And in Chile, next slide, um, he saw some alpine birds as well. For example, the Andean goose on the left. Um, now, I should preface this by saying that um, that if one asked in Darwin's time, you know, how do we account for the webbed feet of ducks? The answer would be um, that God made ducks and He provided them with webbed feet so that they could swim. Okay, in other words, this would be good for the duck and God being very bene beneficent and, uh, and, uh, and all powerful would have provided each species with what it needs for, for, you know, for, for its life, for its survival. But Darwin looks at this Andean goose and in the origin of species, he writes in, you know, in the high Andes, there is a goose um, which hardly ever goes near water. Yet it has webbed feet like other geese. And he says the only the only sensible explanation of that is not 
that God provided it with web feet, you know, because it doesn't use web feet for swimming. The only, the only li likely, ex the, the explanation he provided for that was that that goose had descended from ancestors that did swim. In other words, you are run of the mill geese that do indeed use water a lot. And simply what we were seeing here was a mark of ancestry. Okay, so this is one of countless examples that that um, that uh, Darwin used to drive, you know, to to provide evidence that organisms had had an, a history, that they'd had a history of change, that they had descended from ancestors that had certain characteristics, <laughs> and we could understand some features of organisms because of their ancestors. And on the right is another example. This is an Andean flicker. You, you can write, immediately recognize that it's a flicker. This is an Andean flicker. And Darwin didn't write about the Ande Andean flicker, but he did write about a flicker that he saw in the Pampas of Argentina the campo flicker. Um, and there he says, in the campos, there is a woodpecker, which has all the features of a, of a woodpecker, the, you know, the feet and the, and the tail feathers used for climbing. And it, he says it flies and has a vocalization just like our woodpecker, our green woodpecker back home. So it's obviously a woodpecker, but here is a woodpecker seemingly, you know, clearly made for trees, but there's not a tree within miles. Okay, and so this was another example in which he said these features of this bird must be accounted for in terms of some ancestor that had these features and was indeed a tree climbing bird, a tree climbing woodpecker. So next slide, please. Um, so the the point here is that um, uh, that Darwin, you know, uh, was immediately on the basis of his his observations, including. Many, again and again and again, in The Origin of Species, he gives examples of birds to support his arguments. Okay. Now, um, and of course, one of the, one of the, 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 uh, the uh, big thing is once you start getting to know birds, you realize that they are, there are so many un amazing variations on, on themes. So for example, hummingbirds, you know, we have those that range in size from up at the upper left, the tiny little coquette hummingbirds, to this one, number six here, you know, the giant hummingbird in the palm of someone's hand. So you can see indeed that it is a giant. And so variation in size, variation in bill, the bill shape, look at the curved bill of this white tipped sickle bill hummingbird, or the upturned tip of the all billed hummingbird. And how do we explain these features? How do we explain the extraordinary plumes in patterns on this coquette, the plumes on the head, or these hey, amazing tail feathers? So, and so, you know, how do we how do we explain characteristics like that? You like the tails of this hummingbird and this one over here. And so, there are really two. The the, the what we're facing here is sort of two big questions. One is, and both of which Darwin provided, you know, these amazing answers to. One is, what has been the history of life? Where did all of these organisms and all of their features come from? And that is asking really, what is the, there has been a history to life. Organisms were not, they are not exactly as they were initially created, the, the way uh, creationists would have you believe, but rather they have a history. What can we discern what that history has been? And secondly, we want to explain the features of organisms. Why does this hummingbird have a curved bill? Why does this hummingbird have a long, the extremely long orange and black tail? Um, and, um, uh, you know, sorry, <laughs> lost the train of thought there. Um, so, and Darwin's answer to that question, the question of how do we explain the characteristics of organisms, that for many characteristics, he had an answer that was one of the most original and profound thoughts that anyone has ever had. And this was his idea of natural selection, the mechanism by which the features of organisms that so beautifully suit them for their existence had come into being by a purely natural cause. So that is his great, his great hypothesis of, of natural selection. And so what I want to do in, in this talk is to give you know, just a few examples using birds of some of the ways in which these, um, you know, these principles so that we can understand something, if, if we can know something about the history of organisms, you know, we will uh, you know, under, under, understand quite a few things, as you'll see. And likewise, 
the uh, the study of how or of, of how organisms came to have the features that they have using birds as examples okay and so in the next um, slide um we will see a um a, we will we will basically see that Darwin's hypothesis of natural selection it was absolutely right. He was absolutely right on. On the left is a diagram that very simply explains what natural selection is. You have two genetic strains of some organism. This could be the 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 COVID virus, okay, and one strain is able to transmit itself from one person to, on average, four other people. So it has an R, what's called a four. And the other strain is able to transmit on average from one person to three other people. So it has an average R of three. And what you see is that over the course of five generations of transmission of the virus, that the one that transmits itself to more people is simply going to grow in abundance and eventually take over the entire population of viruses. Whereas the more slowly growing, the more slowly reproducing type of virus um, becomes less and less frequent in the population uh, compared to the, the abundance of the other one. And these two genotypes, I just there used viruses as a, as a very simple example, but this would be true of any pair as we now understand of genes that cause an organism to have one feature versus another, to be slightly larger versus slightly smaller, to have a larger beak versus a smaller beak. So, um, okay, so that's the idea of natural selection that Darwin came up with. Um, and we know uh, from many, many examples now that natural selection is real and it really does account for the, adapt, the adaptive characteristics of, of birds and other organisms. And one of the very best examples, many examples come from studies of birds. And of course, one of the best is the very famous study of, uh, the, um, of beak size in one species of finch in the Galapagos Islands that's been carried out for almost 35 years by Peter Grant and Rosemary Grant who may very well be on their island right now <laughs> as, as we speak. And what they have found, they found as you may know, is that um, during a drought, when, um, uh, when the, so they, this is a species of, of, of bird that feeds on, on relatively small seeds. During their drought, the species of plant that they largely depend on didn't basically didn't really reproduce. And so they, if they were gonna eat it all, they were forced to eat seeds, slightly larger seeds of another plant. And this resulted in greater survival of individuals that had slightly larger bills. And Peter Grant had already shown that the strength and the ability to handle seeds of a larger or smaller size depends on how big the bird's bill is. And so he, and so they showed that birds with bigger bills were surviving better, okay, under these these conditions when they were faced with large seeds, and that um, uh, and that they give that their offspring inherited larger bills, and so for a number of years the bill size on it was basically greater than it had been before, and um, than it had been before, okay, and so that showed right there natural selection, which is to say the difference in the survival and reproductive rate of two types of birds, those who had slightly smaller versus slightly larger bills, and that one was able to survive and reproduce better than the other. And this resulted in that type becoming more abundant. Later on, after about 30 years, it actually happened in reverse because another species of finch invaded the island. This is a finch with a huge bill, which then basically ate all those larger, feeding mostly on the smaller seeds. Um, and they, and indeed, they then evolved bills back to the smaller size that they had been. Okay, so, so, so then, so, so, so there, there's a beautiful demonstration of exactly what what um, Darwin had been talking about, and showing that indeed bills evolve by natural selection at a rate that Darwin never imagined that, that would actually happen. Darwin never imagined that you could actually see slight evolutionary changes happening just within your lifetime, you know, within, within a period of a couple of decades. 
But um, but Peter and Rosemary Grant and many other in, in many other studies have shown that it is indeed possible to show the 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 workings of natural selection and to see population the characteristics of populations change as that goes on. So the, now the so the notion of natural selection explains just an almost <laughs> I won't say every characteristic of every organism, but a great great many. And including some that are very puzzling. And one, one, you know, one feature that you might find puzzling is the bird of this sword-billed hummingbird. Um, this was a bird that I really looked forward to seeing when I first went to the Andes, and I wasn't disappointed. This is one spectacular bird. And of course, the question is, how do we account for this absurdly long bill? And in the next slide, we see that Darwin had a speculation, which, which he didn't make about hummingbirds. He made it specifically about um, this orchid. Darwin was very interested in orchids. He, he grew many of them in his own greenhouse, and he, he studied them in the botanical garden. And he wrote a whole book on orchids. There's the title at the top of the screen. OK, and one of the orchids that he saw was this orchid from Madagascar with a nectar spur. So this is a tube that comes off the petals, and the nectar is down at the bottom of it. It had a nectar spur that was about 10 inches long. And Darwin, just sitting there in England, not, being, not going to Madagascar, said, this orchid must be pollinated by a moth with an equally long proboscis, an equally long tongue. And he then, in you know, in this book, talks about how this the this incredible characteristic of this orchid and of this moth may have evolved. And he says basically there it would be there would be natural selection for moths that had a longer tongue because they would be able to more readily obtain nectar down at the bottom of a nectar tube, even if the nectar tube is rather short. But that means that those individual plants that have the longest nectar tubes would compel the moths to insert their proboscis into the very base, so that the face of the moth would be right there in the flower picking up pollen, okay, and transmitting pollen onto the stigma. So moths with long with long tongues would be more likely to actually transmit pollen between, between, between plants. And this means that those plants with the longest nectar tubes be more likely to be fertilized, he said. These plants, those with long nectaries, therefore would yield the most seed. And the seedlings would generally inherit longer nectaries. And so it would be in successive generations of plant and moth, he said. That is to say, there would, as the as the plant then evolved a somewhat longer nectary, natural selection would favor those moths that had a still longer tongue. And this would keep going back and forth generation after generation over long periods of time, so that you would end up both with this, you know, this this orchid flower and its long nectar tube and this extraordinary moth tongue. Has that been applied to the sword-billed hummingbird? Almost surely that would be that explanation would apply. Okay. And no one has studied the sword-billed hummingbird in this respect. But just to show you how evolutionary biologists go about testing hypotheses such as this, it has been studied with a species of plant and, and a species of fly in the next slide. And this is in, in South Africa, where there are long tubed plants like this member of the iris family and this astonishing fly. Look at the length of the tongue on that fly. Okay. And I mean, it's like it's like a sword built hummingbird, but but even more so. Um, and uh, the and the investigators there said, well, if Darwin's hypothesis is right, we should find that the plants that have the longest nectar tubes um, would be uh, those that um, uh, that get the greatest numbers of pollen grains deposited on them. And that would improve their reproductive success. And likewise, the flies with the longest tongues should be able to consume the most nectar. And in, and so they measured exactly those features: ne nectar consumption by the by flies and pollen grains deposited by individual flies on individual flowers. And each of these data points shows this. So um, so at the top we have for the fly how much nectar was consumed by individual flies that differed along the X axis, the horizontal axis, differed in the length of their proboscis, the length of their tongue. 
And what you see is that although it's, the data are pretty messy because that's the way nature is, um, nevertheless, there is a statistically significant uh, relationship so that on average, those flies with longer tongues do, do indeed consume more nectar, just as you would predict. So that would be an advantage to having a longer tongue. And in the lower, the lower panel, you see the same thing from the point of view of the plant, that the longer the floral, floral tube is, on average, the more pollen grains that, that, that flower would get, and therefore increasing its likelihood of reproductive success. So this is an example of how, how hypotheses about natural selection uh, can be tested um, in nature, and it would be lovely if someone could do that with the sword-billed hummingbird someday. So next slide, please. Um, uh, so natural selection, as it turns out, sometimes doesn't simply cause a characteristic to evolve more and more in one direction. Sometimes natural selection is the explanation for why you find to, why you find variation within a species population. And you know we as birders are are familiar with variation. You know you think, for example, of the white and blue forms of the snow goose, the so-called blue goose, um, or you think of the eastern screech owl that we have that you would, that has both a red a red morph and a gray morph, or you think of rough-legged hawks. You know a small fraction of them are are entirely black. And we'd like to be able to explain these cases of what's called polymorphism, meaning many forms, two or more forms of a species. Um, and one example of this is a bird that I was absolutely thrilled when I saw it in Ghana, the black-bellied seed cracker. And I was thrilled because I'd read a paper many years before uh, by Thomas Smith at UCLA, who studied this bird in Cameroon, I believe it was, um, in which he basically um, asked, does it make any difference to a finch whether its bill is small or large or in between? And what he and basically what he did then was to mark individual uh, birds, many, many, many of them, and trace basically trace trace how many of them survived um, uh, from you know, from that you know, from from when they fledged from the nest up through adulthood. And what he found was indeed that the number of individuals um, that uh, uh, that died <laughs> was I'm sorry that's that well, can't remember what the green is. The number that survived is in blue. Um, and the green, I think, are those that died, right, um, before, you know, uh, during the course of the study. And what he found was it's advantageous to have either a small bill, low is short length, or a long, you know, longer bill, a bigger bill that's that's longer. And again, he found it's because they tend to eat different kinds of seeds, and each, you know, and a large versus a small bill more efficiently are more efficient tools for husking um, and, and feeding on seeds of different size and, and hardness. Another, next slide please, wonderful example of polymorphism is in the European cuckoo, the common cuckoo of Europe. Um, and it's conceivable, maybe some of you in the audience have actually seen this individual bird, which was not in Europe, it was in Rhode Island. Uh, and the picture here is by Lisa Nasta, uh, and I thank her for providing it. Um, this is a bird that many of us drove up to see because a, a common cuckoo from Europe is extraordinarily rare in Eastern North America. Well, the interesting thing about common cuckoos is, of course, they're brood parasites like our cowbirds. Okay, and the interesting thing about them is that in a in any given population of common cuckoos, different females lay eggs of that have different colors and patterns. And this is specifically matched to the kind of the color and pattern of the to, of the egg of the bird that that individual most parasitizes. So, in other words, you have races of the cuckoo that are adapted and focus that you know basically lay their eggs in the nest of one or another you know, species. They specialize on different on different birds that they parasitize. One of them is the European robin, for example. Um, another is the dunnock. Another is the is the the uh, the reed warbler. And I don't remember which is which, but these are the natural eggs of of seven species, uh, six species rather of ho of bird hosts. Okay, and here are the eggs that are matched by the female, you know, gen genetic type of female uh, that that usually parasitizes that particular species. 
And the only case that doesn't match very well is right here. That's the, that's this is a dunnock egg, um, and and dunnocks they're these little things called sometimes called hedge sparrows. Um, apparently, they don't really discriminate the way the way the other species of birds do, which is if they find a foreign looking egg in their nest, they toss it out. And so there's been selection on the cuckoos, natural selection, to have an egg color pattern that resembles the host so that the host is unlikely to recognize it as being foreign and to dispose of it. Okay. Um, so this is a beautiful example of polymor polymorphism, a variation that's maintained by natural selection, where you have different types within a population that are adapted to different resources. So the resources in this case being the kind of egg of a uh, of bird that that, uh, that you get to rear your offspring. Let's see. The next would be, please. Next. Um, would be, well, okay, so how do we explain differences among species? Um, these are these are all different species of wood creepers in tropical America, and they, they act kind of like our nuthatches uh, for the most part. Um, but you see that they have different bills. This one very short, slightly upturned, various lengths here, some of them stouter like this one, some of them very slender like this one. Here's the long-billed wood creeper, with, which is a big bird with this very long bill. And it turns out that indeed they feed in somewhat different places using their bills in somewhat different ways. Um, so the long-billed hummingbird, for uh, long-billed <laughs> uh, wood creeper, uh, for example, feeds mostly by plunging its bill into bromeliads, into these these um, uh, and in between the leaves, pulling out insects or other or other prey that it finds there. And Darwin had postulated that closely related species, such as those, those that have come from, a, from one common ancestor, that they would be selected to become different from one another, to use different resources, and to become adapted in their bills or other characteristics, to become adapted to those different resources. Um, why? Because that way they would tend to avoid competing with one another. And any individuals of one species that would have a bill that's different from other, the other species in the environment. Um, if it had a shorter bill, for example, it would be adapted to feed in particular ways on a resource that would be, to some, to some extent, its own resource, not, com not competing for it with these other species. So this was Darwin's hypothesis. Um, and is there evidence for it? Yes, there most certainly is, you know, from studies of birds and some other organisms as well, but certainly from birds. And we see an example in the next slide, in which I apologize, in which this is a um, a Titicaca grebe. This is a species of grebe that is found only in Lake Titicaca um, in the in the Andes of uh, uh, the at the uh, the border of Bolivia and Peru. And the next slide shows data on the length of the bill of the Titicaca grebe, which has a rather long bill, and the much more widespread white tufted grebe, which is up at the same altitudes and has a much shorter bill. And here we see plotted, and I'm sorry, this is not my figure, so I guess I shouldn't apologize for it's looking so messy, but every dot in this figure represents the length of a bill of an individual grebe. Okay, and let's first let's look at the white tufted grebe, which is distributed. And here, grebes were were collected and measured um, all the way across, going from west from from south to north, path from from the south of Lake Titicaca to the north. And the upper line represents male male grebes, and the lower one is females. And what you see is that the you know they've, they've they, that here in the neighborhood of, of Lake Titicaca the sm bills are smaller than they are further to the south or further to the west you know there's a, there's a lot of scattered there's a lot of variation but on average they're smaller and of course Titicaca is just where the grebe the Titicaca grebe is which has the larger bill and so this is exactly as Darwin predicted that those those white tufted grebes that had larger bills would probably be competing for the same food in Lake Titicaca with the long-billed Titicaca grebe. So it would be advantageous to them for, for them to basically shift and feed on a different resource than you know using different different prey than the Titicaca grebe. Smaller prey is what they actually end up using. 
So in their in Titicaca, the white tufted grebe, instead of feeding mostly on fish, is feeding on smaller crustaceans. And basically, it's, it's undergoing sort of a displacement, um, as it's called, from the Titicaca grebe, where these species are essentially exerting natural selection on one another, then pushing one another apart so that they become adapted for feeding on different on different resources. And so this is part of you know, this is Darwin's you know, insight into one of the major reasons that species would become different from one another and give rise to the extraordinary proliferation of different birds that we have uh, ultimately. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, is a Willison's bird of paradise. And I feel very fortunate to have seen one of these from a distance of maybe three feet um, in, uh, in, on an island off the west coast of Papua New Guinea, or actually of, of West Papua rather. Why three feet? Because in the dark of night before dawn, we trudged up a, a steep slippery hill and lay down on the ground behind a screen of ferns that had been set up so that we could peer through the screen of ferns at the courtship ground of this, of a male, uh, of a male um, uh, Wilson's bird of paradise. Look at this thing with its astonishing bare blue head and these brilliant red and, and yellow and black feathers and tail feathers like no other bird. These are two central tail feathers that, that form the corkscrews. I mean, what an extraordinary creature. How can we account for that? How could we possibly account for the evolution of that? Or next slide or the many other birds of paradise with that all have their own, many of these astonishing characteristics. King of Saxony's bird of paradise in which the male has this almost plastic looking pair of plumes on the head that are longer than its body. You know, the blue bird of paradise that hangs upside down during its courtship display and all these others. How do we account for these? Darwin wrote a whole book on the topic or almost a whole book, half a book. Um, and it was his most famous book, probably after The Origin of Species, and it is called um, The Descent of Man, comma, and Selection in Relation to Sex. And the first half, the first um, kind of 40% of the book is about human, his, his ideas about human evolution. And he thought that many human characteristics could be due to what he called sexual selection. And the rest of the book was devoted to, docu to, to explaining and documenting features that he thought were explainable by, by what he called sexual selection. And in particular, he had countless examples from birds. <laughs> Sexual selection was what? Sexual selection is his idea that any feature that enables males to, re to reproduce more successfully than other males will, of course, then be passed on to their offspring and become characteristic of the species. It's just like selection by the environment, by, you know, except it's by competing with one another for the ability to have offspring with females. And so his idea was that um, in some cases that males would actually battle with one another for possession, the, the ability to, to, to mate with females. But in other cases, it's because females would prefer males that were particularly alluring. Um, and what was alluring turns out to be all these crazy characteristics that we see in the birds of paradise or elsewhere. So... Of course, Darwin had, he had many examples that he thought could be explained by this idea, but he had no direct evidence at all for the existence, the existence of sexual selection. And it really wasn't until the early 1980s that we had some really strong experimental evidence in the next slide, please. Um, uh, by a Danish investig uh, a Swedish investigator, um, Malta Andersson, um, who studied the long-tailed wid uh, widow bird in the grasslands of East Africa. And again, I've seen this bird and I was thrilled to see it. Here's a display. It's like kind of like a red-winged blackbird, isn't it? But with a tail that's about three, three or four times the length of its body. And that is certainly the very kind of feature that Darwin would have attributed to sexual selection. So Malta Anderson said, well, if it's the case that females prefer long-tailed males, uh, we should be able to show that by, first of all, cutting some males' tails down so that they're shorter, and presumably the females would not 
find them very alluring. And what he did then was to paste the cut, the clippings onto the end of the tail of normal males so that he ended up with some males that were abnormally long, the tails way beyond what any female would ever actually have seen. And he, um, and he released them and, uh, and he had controls. Those are the two, the two columns in the middle are, are the controls. And he re released them. And over the course of the next couple of years, he got to see how many females um, built nests with the various males that had each of these treatments. And the data are down in the lower, the lower um, graph here, in which it shows that these short-tailed males attracted very few females compared to, compared to normal males in the middle. And the, the abnormally long-tailed males indeed attracted lots and lots of females. Females found them just irresistible, apparently, uh, even though they'd never seen a male with that long a tail before. So we know that Darwin was right. There is sexual selection. There, that the males compete with one another um, for uh, to to for to for mates, and various features make them more alluring to those mates. Um, and now we have asked the question: Why should females have such weird preferences? Why on earth would female widow birds prefer males that have ridiculously long tails? And next slide, please. Um, there are a couple of hypotheses on this, and it would, I, it would take probably 20 minutes, half an hour to really go through them in depth. So I'll just mention one of them, which I think probably has more going for it right now in terms of evidence than, than the other hypotheses. Okay. And that is the idea that males that have particularly exaggerated character characteristics like long tail feathers or particularly bright characteristics like bright colors okay have they have to expend energy to be able to develop those features and that may be an indication that these males are physiologically particularly vigorous that they're particularly strong that they've got good genes that enable them to re to be so efficient and 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 active um, and if that's the case, then individuals that are pre preferred by, by females because of their tail or their coloration or whatever, um, if that's the case, we should find that, the, that those females have more offspring or more healthy offspring in one way or another. And there is indeed some evidence for that from birds. And so it turns out, so barn swallows in North America, we know them well, and they have kind of orangey underparts. But if you go to Europe or Asia, you'll see that they have white underparts. And also the outer tail feathers aren't, aren't quite as long as they are in North America. And um, Rebecca Safran at the University of Colorado has studied these barn swallows in both areas and has found that indeed females, and she's, she has manipulated them like by cutting and pasting tail feathers and color, coloring the breast cover and so forth. She's shown that indeed female barn swallows prefer different color breasts in North America compared to Europe and, um, and also different, different length tail feathers. And what she's found is that, is that the, 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 the males that have the the, uh, the the coloration which is most orange or with the longest tail feathers in North America, those males apparently have offspring that are more resistant to certain brood parasites, to certain species of lice. Okay. And the opposite is true in Europe, where the offspring of white-bellied males with shorter tails, again, are more resistant to disease. Okay. And the same thing has been shown with our common yellow throat, which differs between Wisconsin and New York. I think the Wisconsin birds have a bigger black mask, whereas the New York birds have a more brighter yellow throat. And, um, and it's been shown that in both cases, the features that are of that, of those features in Wisconsin versus New York are correlated with greater immune response, but apparently a stronger immune system. Um, and so it looks as if Darwin may be right, and that and that the this this very mysterious preference of females um, for 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 males with strange characteristics that at least in some cases it may be because those males are genetically you know more vigorous and are passing on a kind of vigor to their offspring that may make them um, basically basically healthier and more resistant to disease. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, I'm going to have to sort of abbreviate the lecture because we did get a bit of a late sh uh, start, but I do want to say a few things about, so we've been talking about the causes of evolution and specifically natural selection in its several forms, including sexual form, a particular form of natural selection, and showing that that idea, this incredibly brilliant insight of Darwin, explains a vast variety of features of birds as it does of organisms in general. And in really, it explains the fact that organisms are so beautifully adapted to so many aspects of their environment. The other big part of, of the origin of species, of course, is Darwin's effort to convince people that evolution has happened, specifically, that the species we see today have evolved from ancestral species that were quite different, and those in turn evolved further back in time from, from more remote ancestors. And in the last chapter of The Origin of the Species, Darwin is daring enough to say that he thinks it's likely that all animals of all kinds, vertebrates and invertebrates alike, have come from one common ancestor and all plants from one common ancestor. And he says, if we extend this, 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 um, this notion, this logic, he says, it is possible that all living things have evolved from one original ancestral form of life. It's one of the most staggering speculations and hypotheses that anyone has ever had. And now we know, we're quite sure that he was right. That's what molecular biology has shown. But we're talking about birds, not, not all of life. And so here's an example of, a, of an evolutionary tree. This is Darwin's, this is what Darwin is talking about. He says, he's, he would you know, postulate that these warblers came from a common ancestor, which is right here this, on, on the graph. And that group of warblers had a common ancestor with these warblers way back further in time. So what we're showing here is a tree grow, that's growing from left to right. And, um, um, and the further left you go, the further back in time you, you go. So this is a phylogeny of some species of, of, our, of our warblers in the genus Cetophaga, um, done by Irby Levitt at Cornell University, in which, based on DNA sequences, um, in which he is es estimated that the common ancestor of all of these Cetophaga species lived around 45 million years ago. There's another whole thing about how we could estimate the time. Okay. Um, and, ba and basically what he's saying is, you know, and is that the DNA tells us that Townsend's and black-throated green warblers are, are, are very close relatives, that the hermit warbler is cl closely related to them, but it's slightly, but it has a somewhat more distant ancestor. So the, it's as if these had the same mother, but the three, but the hermit warbler had the same grandmother with the Townsend's and, and the black-throated. Um, and if you go further back in time, you'll find way, way back, there was a great, 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 great grandmother, so to speak, um, who was the ancestor of all of these, of all of these species of warblers. Um, <clears throat> Now, there's, there's a huge literature on how we can best estimate these phylogenetic trees. That's what these tree-like diagrams are that reflect, that uh, portray relationships. Um, but what's, you know, but for our purposes, what's more interesting is what can you do with them? You know, um, it's fascinating to know who's related to whom, but from that information, we can make various other kinds of inferences. Next slide, please. Um, well, let's just skip over. This is just to say that at this point, based on the fact that we can use entire genomes, the, the DNA sequence of entire genomes, that's a huge amount of information to determine who's related to whom. Uh, to whom. And so this is just part of the huge phylogeny of all the families of birds in the world uh, by Rick Prum at Yale University and his colleagues. So next slide, please. Um, but one of the things we can do, for example, is to begin to understand why some groups of organisms are distributed geographically the way they are. And a particularly stunning example is in the so-called paleognath birds. It means ancient jaw. It has to do with their jaw structure. Um, and these are all the flightless ones, the ostrich in Africa and rheas in South America and cassowaries and, and emus in Australia and, and uh, New Guinea. 
and um and down here is i can't see it but oh that's kiwis in in um, in new zealand and then there are a couple of extinct forms as well um and those are all called the ratites those are the big flightless ratites but also the Paoignathi include a family in south america the tinamous that look kind of like chickens with partridges and um and this is one of the few slides, by the way, that I took myself. I'm the world's worst bird photographer, but I, I dared to show you this one. Um, and the tinamous can fly. That's the key point. All these others are flightless. The tinamous can fly. Now, why is this interesting? Next slide, please. Back in the past, it was thought that the Paoignathus birds were divided into two, two main groups, one being the tinamous that can fly, and the other being all the big flightless birds. And the idea was that the ancestor, there was one, one, oh, one species, mm. one species evolved the loss of flight, and it gave rise to all of these flightless birds in turn. And if that was the case, you had to, it was puzzling to understand how you would get flightless birds from one ancestor distributed in Africa and South America and Madagascar and New Zealand and Australia. And there were big hypotheses about how continental drift might be responsible for this. And that's what this, this diagram is over here, was the idea of how it might be that there was one ancestor one flightless ancestor that was on Gondwana, and Gondwana broke into pieces that became Africa and South America and all those other land masses, and the descendants and this and this one bird was distributed widely over that that over Gondwana, um, and its descendants then on the various pieces of Gondwana evolved into ostriches and rheas and the rest of them. But we now know from DNA sequences. That this isn't that this phylogenetic tree is not quite right. In fact, it's quite wrong in a very important way. Next slide. Now that we have much more data, um, let's just let's go on from here. This just says what I just um, um, said. Um, oh, let me let now let's let's go back there. Sure. Okay. Um, this is this. Uh, this is the this is the geology that we need need to be taken into account. Okay, so um, by the late by about ninety million years ago, I want you to notice that these continents, uh, what are today the southern continents, are already pretty well separated from one another. Okay, and certainly by thirty million years ago, they're almost almost distributed as they are today. So these pieces were separate by ninety million years ago. Okay, what's now? Next slide, please. Okay. From massive genome studies, genomic studies, um, this this particular study um, being having been led by um, 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 <laughs> by by my good friend Scott, who just spoke last night at <laughs> at um, um, uh, at and at the Linnean Society, we now know that um, tinamous. Where are the tinamous? Tinamous are embedded in. Wait, sorry, which is which is the tinamou? This is here. This is the tin. No, this is this is this is the tinamou here. I can't see what's over, I can't see what's over off the right side of my screen. Um, um, right. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so this would be the tinamous, and so, right. Yeah. So the the red line shows the tinamous. Right. Okay, and the tinamous are not separate from the rest of them. Rather, the tinamous are embedded. They're just one branch among many, right? Among all these flight, among the flightless birds, you have one flight flying lineage, the tinamous. Now, it's very unlikely that the tinamous had a flightless ancestor because if you lose wings and all the apparatus that's needed for flight, that's so complicated that it's very unlikely that it would evolve back to its original state, okay, and enable flight again. And so if the Tenemus um, had, you know, if their ancestor could fly, well, here's an ancestor back here in time, but it also happens to be the common ancestor of the ostrich, okay. which means that the ostrich must have lost flight since it had the common ancestor to the Tenemus. But now let's look back further at the flying ancestors of the Tenemus and it goes further back. 
to the point where the common ancestor of the tinamou and the ostrich on one hand and all these other flightless flying birds like the emu on the other hand well they must since that ancestor gave rise to the flying tinamous and it could fly it means that this branch must have lost flight independently of the ostrich and likewise for this branch um, and likewise for this branch in other words at least four separate times flightlessness and sort of a gigantic size evolved among these rat type birds and that suggests and furthermore this all happened about 70 million years ago or so, which is more recent than when the, those pieces of Gondwana had already separated considerably. And so the DNA now, at the interpretation of the phylogeny now, based on better data from DNA, basically says that these giant flightless birds independently became flightless on the separate land masses, and those land masses were already separated from one another when those birds evolved, the rhea line and the ostrich line and the cassowary line the, and the emu line. They were, the, the land masses were already separated. And so that means that those land masses were almost certainly colonized by flying relatives of the, of the tenemu, flying relatives that on each continent then independently evolved to be gigantic and flightless. And so we have what the convergent evolution between ostriches and cassowaries and, and, and the emu and rheas, independently evolving the, this giant size and flightlessness. And that's one of the that's an example of the insights into evolutionary history that you can have from these phylogenies that are based nowadays largely on similarities and differences in DNA. Um, and so, um, and so I, you know, I, th I think we're at this point, you know, birds as well as many other organisms, you know, are showing us, you know, finally in sort of, you know, Darwin's ideas in full glory, so to speak, um, uh, in which we're able to, to plumb them deeper and deeper than, than ever before. Um, can we see what the next slide is, please? Right. Um, you know, just a couple of final words, you know, you, I, because we started late, I, I'll, I'll go for two or three more minutes, but uh, I'm going to have to sort of you, you stop it. But, you know, but this brings up, of course, the whole issue of how do we explain the geographic distributions of different groups of birds? And that was, you know, I'll just give you one example, which is really fascinating. And it turns out that, of course, one of the ways in which you explain distributions is birds flying from one place to another, you know, and certainly that is often the case. Um, but another, but another aspect of distribution that you have to take into account is extinction. And so we know from the fossil record that birds have not always been distributed where they are today. And I will never forget sitting at my desk, you know, I have subscribed, still subscribe to the journal Science that arrives, arrives every week, and, you know, got it out of my mailbox, and I looked at the table of contents, and I could not believe my eyes. I saw this title, Old World Fossil Record of Modern Type Hummingbirds. That blew me away, because there are more than 300 species of hummingbirds, and all of them are in America. You know, mostly South America and, and tropic, you know, mostly tropical America, but also North America. And it just, you know, I just find this found this mind blowing. But here was that fossil, and it very clearly is a hummingbird that was found in Germany. Um, and since then, some more of them have also been found in you know, more recently in, in in Europe. So we know that hummingbirds were widely distributed, and where they first originated is probably anyone's guess at this point. Um, but there's no reason to think that they necessarily originated in the only part of the world that they're found in today. So, so we have to explain their, dis their distributions by extinction. And likewise, likewise, here's a Turaco, one of the, the family that's related to cuckoos, and um, uh, uh, that in, related to cuckoos, and if you want to see a turaco, and and if you've never seen a turaco in a zoo or whatever, go to Africa and see them. They are gorgeous birds. Um, they're you know sort of the, the size of a uh, what are they the size of, sort of crow sized, we're a little bit, we're a little bit bigger. Now, um, um, anyway, look at this beautiful beautiful turaco. Um, and if, as I say, today you will you will have to go to Africa to see them, but there are fossils of them in North America. 
Okay, so there are many, many cases in which the geographic distributions of birds today are different from what they were. Next slide, please. Let's just see what it is. And um, and I think that basically is is I suddenly discovered this is the end this is the end of the presentation because I could say a lot more about the geographic distributions of birds um, but fortunately I had anticipated or apparently my slide file anticipated that we might be running late and so it has um, it has transformed itself into my final slide uh, I think my final slide my final slide is this astonishing bird, the spoon-billed sandpiper. This is an almost mythical bird. You know, what, what do you have to do to see a, a, a spoon-billed sandpiper? Well, I think you could probably get permission to go to certain areas in the far east of Russia uh, to see them on their breeding grounds, or else you go to Thailand in winter and hope that you can see some there. I mean, that's one of the very few places in the wintering grounds where I have been fortunate enough to see two of them. And um, it is a highly endangered species. Uh, it's become, as many shorebirds are in Asia, is becoming in, less common all the time as coasts are, coastal regions are developed. So essentially there's no place for these shorebirds to sit down and feed and basically, you know, get the energy they need to carry on their, their migrations. Um, the, and so this is of course, one of many, many species of birds that are, um, that look as if they're headed toward extinction. And so I felt it necessary in my book, I wanted in, to, to, in my book, to treat in the final chapter, the question of, you know, what do evolutionary biologists have to say about the future prospects of birds and other organisms? I mean, there are so many insults, so many onslaughts being made by humans uh, uh, against them. First and foremost is, at least up until now, has been habitat destruction. So you know, for example, is this the, is it the last slide? I'm not sure if it's the last slide or not, Brian. Um, no. No. no, actually, Here's... it says uh, 26 of 58. Oh, my God. No, forget the 58. <laughs> okay. We're going to stop here. Um, well, so, you know, so, you know, there are, of course, you know, many causes, many ways in which humans are causing extinction. Um, uh, obviously, habitat destruction here, the, the destruction of forests. We know about the Amazon, but elsewhere in the world as well. That's a huge issue. Um, the uh, um, the pet trade is responsible for the you know the rarity and the, the many species of parrots and macaws being close to extinction. Uh, it's responsible for the fact that if you want to see a Java sparrow, um, don't bother going to Java because they're extinct there. Uh, you will either see one see a tiny little population in Bali, or else you'll go to Hawaii or some other place where escaped ca cage birds you know cage birds have escaped. Um, and so it is, and of course we have climate change as well. Probably the next slide refers to climate change. Um, and, and in any case, what we know is, and I think everyone in, I'm sure in the, in the audience knows, that there has been a tremendous decline of birds generally throughout the world. And that has certainly been the case here just in North America, this rather recent study from Cornell showing the change is has been positive for wetland birds, especially especially ducks, um, and that I have to say is largely in North America due to the um, um, national. Um, um, uh, um, um, <laughs> what am I talking about? Um, preserves um, throughout the throughout the the Midwest, uh, um, uh, national wildlife, um, whatever. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. Um, and and just parenthetically, I want to say that part of the the health, shall we say, of duck populations is due to duck hunters, mm -hmm. because if it weren't for them, we would not have those those natural wildlife refuges in which so many of our ducks um, succeed. But every other group of birds, in terms of where they live or taxonomic groups over here on the right. Almost all of them have suffered serious decline, and that's just in North America, where at least three billion birds, you know, there are at least three billion birds fewer today than there were in 1970, is the estimate. 
And of course, in many parts of the world, it's worse. Um, Southeast Asia is, is I mean, it's just, it, it, it's appalling, the destruction of habitat there, especially for oil palm growing. Um, and you can read, you know, you, you can read in today's, literally in today's paper about destruction in East Africa, where there, there's massive, massive oil development that's in the works. Okay. Um, so between that and climate change um, and insecticides reducing the abundance of insects in a really appalling way, um, is there really any hope for birds? Um, and one question that you know should be able to ask as an evolutionary biologist is, well, what's the likelihood that birds are going to be able to adapt to these changes? And I have to say that on the whole, I'm pretty pessimistic about that. You know, um, forest living birds don't just suddenly quickly adapt to living in meadows or hedge, you know, or or road edges, you know, in road ed edge vegetation, um, and uh, and the massive habitat destruction is basically guaranteed to to eliminate many many species. Um, um, Climate, you know, climate change is another matter. Certainly, some many species are going to succeed by shifting their range. We know that many bird species are indeed uh, shifting their, their range um, as it gets warmer. And this, of course, has been going on for a very long time. When I was in high school, you did not see red-bellied woodpeckers or mockingbirds on Long Island. Um, these, you know, and now, of course, they're as common as can be. Those were southern species um, that have been moving north, like many others. Um, and and that has continued to be the case, and it's being documented how some species are shifting their altitudinal range higher, you know, basically basically sort of tracking their their environment, the environment that they're adapted to. Okay, and that has been the case throughout evolutionary history to a very large extent. By and large, species are much more likely to survive if they can move in space and track the, the environment that is moving, the environment to which they are already adapted, much more likely than to survive if they simply simply in place and adapt to changes that are happening in terms of massive climate changes that may be happening around them. And so, you know, 10,000 years ago or so, there were spruce trees and walruses in Louisiana. Um, and because that's that's where it was cold, <laughs> and, and of course, further north it was colder still. Um, but uh, but the point is that, and you certainly didn't have any tropical or subtropical species living there then. So I'm very pessimistic about the likelihood that bird species are going to adapt genetically to climate uh, to climate change. I'm pretty pessimistic about their adapting to um, pesticides, and but although they'll, they'll, that'll probably happen in some cases, um, I'm very pessimistic about their adapting to the loss of their food supply with the what's being called the the insect apocalypse that's happening now, the drastic decline of insects in many parts of the world, including here, um, and. Um, I'm hopeful that many species will be able to track their the, their their climate niche, um, the, their their thermal niche, the way red-bellied woodpeckers have. Um, but on the whole, it's it seems to me that what that says what that says is it just cries out for conservation. And so, of course, the Audubon societies are have been for a long time leaders in conservation. Conservation is something I think we all can contribute to in one way or another, whether it's by supporting societies such as this, um, or um, uh, you know, or voting for candidates that you think are going to have a conservation-oriented, uh, you know, a, a agenda, or at least at least not be as destructive as as, as many of them are. Um, we can, you know, we can we can educate young people and just make them aware of the beautiful. The beauty that is to be seen around them, you know, the variety of, of plants and butterflies and birds and everything else. Um, and so I think we can all play some some role in stem, stemming the, the likelihood of, of, of extinction to, to at least some extent. And I think that, Brian, that we should stop there. I think, uh, I think I've said enough. Thank you.
Okay, so um, thank you for that that excellent, fascinating presentation. And and I just want to say that if organizations like ours can do anything for conservation, it's because people like you have educated people to to care about birds. Well, so, I, I, yeah, well, we can't do it without you. I, well, and well, and uh, you know, of course, and I was educated, I, and I was educated to, to to be aware of birds, and and they weren't university professors who were educating me. I can tell you, <laughs> so yeah, we can all educate. We 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 all can play a role. You know? um, so. Okay, so um, if if there are any questions, feel feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself. Okay, it looks like we had some some questions in the chat here. Um, we have one question, did all living things evolve from a single atom going way back? A single atom? Oh, I don't know. I don't know anything about atoms. Um, well, well, I mean, all living things lived, <laughs> evolved from, you know, basically macromolecules. Um, and this is a very, very this is a big area of research in which I feel really ignorant because um, let's put it this way, I almost flunked organic chemistry. That was my that was my worst subject. And um and that really and that really is <laughs> sorry, Joe. <laughs> um uh I know that's I know you but that must really hurt. <laughs> anyway, the um 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 uh what was I about to say? So um so you know so the, the, there's an active area of study in terms of the actual origin of life but of course you know there's a whole universe of atoms out there so um that form you know that form molecules so certain certainly all living things didn't evolve from one atom but they certainly almost surely did evolve from one original form of life and then the question is what was that original form of life it almost certainly was a some complex probably of rna or an rna like molecule um, together with proteins and there's a big issue about how do you get the origin of both rna and proteins because today each depends on the other and, and to be synthesized um, and so as i said this is an area in which i am totally unqualified um, but one you know but we are uh, but we have you know we have some pretty good ideas of what the first um cellular organisms were like at least and um and it's quite clear from the genome sequences of all of all, all organisms that have cells ranging from bacteria up through vertebrates um, and plants and fungi and, and 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 everything else. I mean, it's quite clear that yeah, there's a common ancestor that basically evolved the basic molecular features that are shared by all living things, you know, such as RNA, for example. Yeah. Guy, has, you have your hand up. Uh, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Yeah, I, I read something interesting about the evolution of wolves uh, into dogs. Uh, and according to the hypothesis, it was very different from um, evolution of the fittest. Instead, they say it was evolution of the friendliest, that the hypothesis is that, that we have the modern day dog because uh, certain wolves were very friendly toward humans. And this uh, caused their evolution into becoming uh, dogs, and that the, the the survival of the fittest doesn't doesn't apply to evolution of wolves into dogs. Do you agree with that, or have any comments? Um, I don't. I don't disagree with the the uh, the story that's being told about about the evolution of dogs. Although I think it's maybe a little more complex than that. But I do disagree with the interpretation of the survival of the fittest. Um, this is a much, much, much misunderstood phrase, um, and um, uh, and it wasn't Darwin's phrase. Actually, it was Herbert Spencer's. Um, but um, but the fittest, in modern terms, what Darwin meant by by fit is ability to survive and reproduce. It does not mean being stronger or nastier or you know more capable of wiping out your opponents. Um, it means it means. I mean, literally, the 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 te fitness is a technical term in evolutionary biology, and it means the rate at which a genotype increases in in numbers um, as a as a function of its ability to survive and to reproduce. 
Okay. And so, of course, there are countless examples of cooperation in nature. I mean, and, 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 and anyone who knows birds is very aware of the, the existence of cooperation among individuals. You know, just watch any, you know, watch, watch crows or just, or for that matter, just watch any pair of birds, you know, that are interacting, you know, you know cooperating with one another to, to raise offspring. Um, there's all kinds of seemingly, you know, altruistic behavior. Um, there are many species of birds in which young birds um, don't reproduce for a few years and instead help their parents to raise more offspring. Um, so they're, they're, you know, obviously there's also a kind of cooperation that happens when you see a flock of starlings bunched together to form as a as a group, um, basically providing grading greater protection for every individual against a, you know, a threatening falcon. Um, uh, so, so, uh, so cooperation is, is, is very, very widespread, not in, and not just in birds, um, but, um, but, it is, but you can explain it by the notion of individuals who are genetically prone to be cooperative, basically getting some kind of a payoff in terms of survival or reproduction. Okay, and that can get to be a little complicated in terms of what the nature of that survival reproduction payoff is. Um, so I won't go into it. But um, uh, but anyway, so <laughs> I think I may have said too much in response. But the the issue is that uh, it's not at all surprising that wolves would become in some, sort of tamer and tamer um, uh, as and yeah. One hypothesis is that they started hanging hanging around the edges of of camps and being thrown, you know, food scraps, you know, waste scraps, and they bas that basically induced them to become more and more familiar. We have a, a question going back to selection. Do males ever reject females who have accepted them as mates? Oh, isn't that an interesting question? Um, the answer would be in, I, 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 I'm quite sure the answer is yes. There certainly has been yeah, there certainly has been reciprocal mate, mate choice shown, um, and that'll be the case. That'll be the case um, in in birds that do form pair bonds, where both where both of them are necessary to raise the kids. Okay, um, in I mean in something like like humming, you know, like like ducks or 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 some other species in which only the female uh, raises you know rears the offspring. Um, then I doubt very much that a male would ever reject a female. Um, but if the, but if it's a matter of the pair um, raising them together, then um, then each depends on the other to be reproductively successful. So you want to be sure that you've got a good mate. And of course, this point, you know, this um, uh, it becomes more accentuated um, in the cases in which you have what's you know what's been called sex role reversal. In which the females are competing to get, you know, to get a male to mate with them, uh, and the males are the ones that are, in some sense, you know, playing coy, um, and um, uh, and you see this. I've seen this in in Smith's Longspur, in which the female will have several males associated with her, and they're they are they're, you know, they they they're all competing with one another to for her attentions. But you also get it the other way around, in which um, in which you can have. Uh, multiple females and, and, and one male. Here's another great question. Which species of bird that has never been seen in New York will be the next addition to our state list? <laughs> oh my. Well, you know, there, there's some of my friends and acquaintances actually have been, have been developing exactly that list and I should have it memorized. And I'll bet there's at least one person in the audience who does have that list memorized. And, and you're like and, placing your bets on this, you know? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think it's going to be Flacco. Um, this, a, um, I'm trying to think of what was the most, the, a, 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 a recent one that uh, that had made the cut. I mean, yeah, the, there was a gray-breasted Martin, for example, uh, I guess it was last year in Prospect Park. And um, that was a first for New York State, um, and I think I think that was probably um, on Doug Gottschfeld's list. Uh, he was the one who found it. Um, there are a few people like Doug Gottschfeld who have made up a list of what to expect next. Um, uh, uh, Bermuda petrel was was on that list, and finally last year one finally one finally made it. Yeah. 
but I'm, yeah, I'm not would, sure. What, what would you say? What bird would actually establish itself here? Yeah, that's that. That's a good question. You know, this would be pretty. This would be pretty wild. But um, over the course of the last few decades, what we've seen is you know a lot of these southern uh, wading birds become established. So you know, I mean, at fir first it was things like you know great egret and snowy egret, and then little blue heron, and you know yellow crown night herons, and 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 glossy ibis, and so on. I mean, the first glossy ibis nest in New York was found, I think, by Peter Post when when I was in either in high school or college. Um, so so it's that recent. So how about either roseate spoon? How about roseate spoonbill? There were a whole bunch of roseate spoonbills last year that came up into New York. So so uh, let's 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 give them. Let's, I'd, I'd I'd give them a, a a vote. I'm sure I could think of others, but that would be that would be a possibility. Next oh, here's one. oh, here's one. Oh, here's one. Here's here's one. No, here's one that's that is really fascinating. You know, you you, you and I could drive in a few hours out of the range of black capped chickadee and into the range of Carolina chickadee. Just go a little ways down New Jersey, and there they are. And to my knowledge, there has never been a Carolina chickadee report re re recorded in New York State, but they're so close. And if the you know, they basically they they meet at a zone at which there's a little bit of hybridization, but clearly there's sort of competition between them. And they seem not to be able to invade each other's range. So with climate change, I would expect the black cap chickadee to be retreating northward and the Carolina to be shifting east you know, northward. And it doesn't have very far to go at all before it hits Staten Island and 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 even and Long Island. Next question. Is there a common dinosaur that has led to the modern bird? Yeah. There is a group of dinosaurs um, that includes Tyrannosaurus. Um, these are the theropod dinosaurs, but they were quite diverse. Um, and um, and, and in, of course, picking out any one of them as being the ancestor, it would be it would be very risky. Even even if we had had fossils of all the dinosaurs that there were, and of course we don't. But but there is and has been known ever since the 1860s. There has been known a dinosaur with feathers, and that that could very well have been the ancestor. But if not. If it wasn't the ancestor, it was certainly very closely related to the ancestor. And that dinosaur is named Archaeopteryx. You may have heard heard reference to it as the the first bird that's known from the fossil record, <clears throat> but it it really is a dinosaur with a feather with feathers. It's in you know anatomic, its skeletal anatomy just screams dinosaur. Yeah. Hey, next question. Where in New York were the roseate spoonbills? <laughs> um, I saw two of them. I had to go up to uh, where was it? I uh, can't remember. Um, oh, it was it was up past Poughkeepsie somewhere, and I can't remember where it was. Um, but then, but then um, a couple were. Where did I see the other one? Oh, they were. Yeah, there was there was one um, near Cold Spring Harbor. Yeah, that's where it was. And there were others. There were scattered. There were others scattered around through the state. Yeah. Okay. So, are there any other questions? Um, if you've been reading the chat here, you're getting rave reviews. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent program. So. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, I, I'm afraid this it was a little disconnected in in places. Um, wasn't as quite as smooth as it might have been. And um, and I, you know, and I. I I know that in places it probably can get a little technical, and I do my very, very, very best, you know, to make it as non-technical as possible. But um, you know, I, I don't know if I how, how how I succeeded. I I hope that most of the time it was pretty pretty clear and pretty straightforward. Yeah, but but uh, thank I, you, Dirk. Thank you very, very very much <laughs> for the invitation, and thank you, yeah, you know, for you know, thank you, audience, for being there. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, and thank you for for all you do and uh, for, the, for the boost you've given to conservation. And uh, we hope you'll, you'll come back. Okay, I'd, I'd love to. Thank you, bye now.